Hello. Welcome. Um, thanks for being here. It's now 12.12, so we'll get started. Um, before I begin, hi. Oop, sorry. Uh, my name is Noah. I'm directing Lunch Poems this season, and it's really a pleasure to have you all in here. Um, if you could silence your cell phone before we get started, that would make everyone's experience uh, just powdery. Um, and I want to thank the library, the English department, and ETS, and the Arts Research Council uh, for our, their support of Lunch Poems this year. Uh, they make this magic happen. And thank you for coming out and being such a good audience to our readers. Sophia Sinclair's cannibal arrives first as a worm in the ear, a problem in the mouth. Its first poem, Home, lays out the ground. Have I forgotten it, Sinclair asks. Wild conch shell dialect, black apostrophe curled, tight on my tongue. With the conch shell, that oceanic ear, she deploys in those four lines a snaking circuit of listening, reading, eating, and speaking. As this is a deeply read collection that devours its way through the canon, Shakespeare first, Black apostrophe curled tight on my tongue asks to be read as at once the inky punctuation mark with its questions of ownership about to be consumed and as the figure of a dress about to uncurl. Black apostrophe, black speech to an absent person. And as we are consumed by cannibal, we discover that this double being of ink and breath of taking in and producing lies deep at the root of its thinking about language, about femininity, about, about Jamaican place, exile, and identity. It's a book that's as powered by the written edge of its wit, its sharp quatrains and tercets, its world play, the enjambments and triple meanings that we can only fully catch when we see them in print, as it is by its oral qualities, its propulsive oceanic rhythms and that elusive quality we might call charisma or voice. Listen, for instance, to the complex internal rhymes, the powerful O's and R's of this speaker, a self-sufficient Eve slash anaconda, a species which, we might note, can re reproduce without a male. Womb, I boast a vogue sacrosanctum, engorging shored pornographies, the cells unruly strain, Rogue empire multiplying for a thousand virile thousand years, my wings pinned wide in parthenogenesis, such miraculous display. Eve, in Sinclair's version, is the tempter snake, is virgin, through this virgin birth, a heretical reptilian Mary. And we can hear how this reclaimed myth toys with our expectations of clarity, whips language to a proliferating sound, whereas we expect vague sacrosanctum, we're served vogue, in place of the more logical shared pornographies, it's shored. There are as many ways into cannibal as there are virtues in the book. It luxuriates in sensory detail as it reconstructs the Jamaica of childhood, it savages the noxious texts and politics of Thomas Jefferson's and our Virginia. It excavates the allure and the toll of whiteness and social contexts. It uh, liberates and exalts in the menacing sexuality packaged with black femininity. There are also moving and shrewd reflections on family and its disintegrations, on poverty, on the enchanted marginalized lives lived through the Jamaican folk religions, Pocomania and Rastafari. Nor is this to mention the ways Sinclair's keen ear tightens and unspools meters, or how she dances within and without the pressures of fixed stanzas. But in closing, one thing I was struck by this reading was the preponderance of the prefix un amid the restless linguistic creativity everywhere in this book. From the first line of Pocomania, father unbending, father unbroken, father, to the masterwork poem, The Art of Unselfing, to nonce words such as unfossiled and unjungle, and the gamut of unmoors and unburied, 
This pattern hints, I think, at the sheer range of antitheses, of oppressions that this book must undo, unfang, as it pushes toward original expression. The poem Unselfing, for instance, suggests that epistemologically, even the idea of a stable self can be a corpse around one's neck, which it rejects instead for the flux of unmaking and remaking instant to instant. Relatedly, I hear also in these unwords a poignant recognition of poetry's potential failure, of how the power of language and rhetoric to actually ameliorate the world is only ever paper thin. A line like, Father unbending, father unbroken, father, is so touching because it is a via negativa. The words offering us proud and gentle, a frank lie. Sophia Sinclair is the author of Cannibal um, and also the forthcoming memoir, How to Say Babylon, with Simon & Schuster this coming August. Her many honors include a Whiting Award, a Metcalf Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and the Prairie Schooner Book Prize. Her work appears broadly, and she's an associate professor of creative writing at the um, Arizona State University. It's my pleasure to welcome Sophia Sinclair. Wow, thank you so much, Noah, for that wonderful introduction. Um, you know, I've, I've heard many of them over the years, and I would say that's up there as one of the best ones. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to Berkeley for hosting me, to the Morrison Library, and to all of you for coming um, out to hear poems at noon. Um, I am going to be reading some poems from Cannibal, and I think some new poems as well, a few. Um, <laughs> Noah, you already like read half the poems I was going to read. Um, so, uh, so I'll start by reading some poems from Cannibal, and the book is called Cannibal because of the linguistic history of the word. The word cannibal is the English variant of the Spanish word caribal, which comes from the word cannibal, a reference to the native Carib people whom Columbus thought ate human flesh and from whom the word Caribbean originates. So by virtue of being Caribbean, all West Indian people like me are already in a purely linguistic sense, born savage. This is home. Have I forgotten it? Wild conch shell dialect Black apostrophe curled tight on my tongue, or how the Spanish built walls of broken glass to keep me out, but the doctor bird kept chasing and raking me in. This place is your place, reefed in red sargassum, ancient driftwood nursed on the pensive sea, the ramshackle altar I visited often, packed full with fish skull bright with lignum vitae plumes. Father, I have asked so many miracles of it, to be patient and forgiving, to be remade for you in some small wonder. And what a joy to still believe in anything. My diction now as straight as my hair, that stranger we've long stopped searching for. But if somehow our half sunken hearts could answer, I would cup my mouth in warm bowls over the earth and kiss the wet dirt of home taste bogue mud and one long orange peel for skin. I'd open my ear for sugar cane and long stalks of gungo peas to climb in. I'd swim the sea, still lapsing in its sodded frame. The sea 
that again and again calls out my name. This next poem is called Pokomania. And um, as Noah gestured to, Pokomania, also called Kumina, is a Jamaican folk religion that involves dancing and chanting as a way of communing with the past and with the dead. And um, it's actually um, a cultural movement that is in danger of kind of going extinct. It's not as pra practiced as much anymore in Jamaica. And so I try to preserve something of the Kumina or Pokomania ritual in this poem uh, through the rhythm and tempo. This is Pokomania. Father unbending, father unbroken, father with the low hanging belly, father I was cleaved from, pressed into, cast and remolded, father I was forged in the fire of yourself, ripped my vein skin, one eyelid, father my black tangle of hair and teeth, born yellowed and wrinkled, father your jackfruit, foster my overripe flesh, <clears throat> father your first daughter, <clears throat> pardon me, Father, your first daughter, now severed at the ankles. Father, your black machete. I remember your slick smell, your sea dark, your rum froth, wailed and smeared my wet jelly across your cheek. Father, forgive my impossible demands. <clears throat> I conjure you in woven tam, lion of Judah. Father, your red, gold, and green. Father of flag, I am waving. Father of flag, I am burning. Father skittering in on a boat of whale skeleton, his body wrapped in white like an orthodox priest. Father and his nest of acolyte women, his beard coma, his primrose, his dahlia, his Nagasaki blossom, mother and I were none of them. Father washing me in eucalyptus, in garlic, in golden seal, fathering my exorcism, father the harsh brine of my sea, making sounds only the heart can feel. Father, a burrowing insect, his small incision, no bleat but a warm gurgle. Daughter entering this world, a host. Father, your beached animal, your lamentations in the sand. Mother, her red bones come knocking. Mother, her red bones come knocking at the floorboards. My mother knock knocking at his skull when he dreams. Scratching at your door, my dry rattle of Morse code. Father, let me in. With the mashmouth spirits who enter us, Father, the split fibula where the marrow must rust, Father, the soft drum in my ear, Daughter unweeding her familiar mischief, Mother jangling the rib cage, I am here. Um, let's see, I'll read. This poem is called Mermaid. <clears throat> Mermaid. <clears throat> Caribbean time is 10 times stronger than the English variety. Just ask Miss Queenie and her Royal Navy who couldn't yank a Jamaican weed from her rose garden that didn't grow back thick, tenfold, and blackened with the furor of a violated man. The tippet American I sank with my old shoes over the jaws of the Atlantic could never understand the hard clamor of my laugh, why I furrowed rough at the brow, why I knew the hollow points of every bone. But dig where the soil is wet and plant the proud seed of your shame tree. Don't let them say it never grew. Roll that saltfish barrel down the hill, sending that battered thunder clanging at the seaside moon, jangled by her long earrings at our sea, ten times bluer than any blue eye. That minty whistling in the Dutch pot is stronger than liquor and takes six spoons of sugar, please. What can I say? My great-grandfather's blood was clotted thick, with sugar cane and overproof rum. And when he bled, it trickled heavy like molasses, clotted black like phlegm in the throat. 
Every red ant from the grill to Frenchman's Cove came to burrow and suckle at his vein where his leg was honeyed with a diabetic rot. And when he caught my grandmother in his wide fishing net, he served her up cold to his wild-eyed son, mermaid on the deck. Um, <clears throat> this next poem is one that Noah also mentioned in his intro. And I wrote it while I was getting my PhD at USC. Um, and I remember being in the program and feeling very frustrated with um, the syllabus that I was being asked to contend with um, because I, I'd felt like at that point I had done so much schooling that I arrived at my PhD and was kind of dismayed to find that, um, you know, that the syllabus I was being asked to read was the same, the same old dead white men. And in this class I took on uh, Victorian literature, um, it seemed that the, the professors would always have a very um, unvaried uh, <laughs> reading list and they would throw in one black author. And but in particular, it was always seemed to be W.E.B. Du Bois. And in this class, even in a class on Victorian literature, the one black author they included was W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, and so I kind of decided that in these classes, I would try to make them work for me, that I tried to find something in the class that I could, from which a poem could bloom. And so during this um, course, I discovered that Victorian women were forbidden from practicing botany because um, the men thought that the cross sections of plants and flowers too closely resembled female genitalia. And so I was like, okay, yeah, I can definitely make that work for me. <laughs> and so the, this poem kind of bloomed from that thought. This is Portrait of Eve as the Anaconda. I too am gathering the vulgarity of botany, the eye and its nuclei for mischief. Of man redacted, I came, I'm coming, fasting, carving, carved myself, a selfish idol, its shell unsuitable. I, twice discarded, arrived thornside, and soon outgrew his reptilian sheen, a fine specimen. Let me have it, something in violet, Splayed in bird lime, legs an exposed anemone against jailbait August, its x ray sky. This light, a gorgon slick, polygamous doom. And God, again, calling much too late, who aches to stick an ache in my unmentionable. His primal plant remains elusive, wildfire and pathogen. Blood knot of human fleshed there in his beard. How I am hot for it. Call me murderous, a glowing engine timed to blow. Watch it go with unjealousy, shadow. Let me have it. This maidenhead primeval schemes what ovule of cruel invention, the Venus trap the menses, and how many ways to announce this guilt, whore's nest of ague, supernova, wild stigmata, womb. I boast a vogue sacrosanctum, engorging shored pornographies, the cells unruly strain, rogue empire multiplying for a thousand virile thousand years, my wings pinned wide, in parthenogenesis, such miraculous display. Okay, I'll read. Um, as Noah mentioned, I lived in Charlottesville, Virginia for a short time when I was getting my master's. Um, and 
you know, I, I got there from Jamaica and I was so stunned by so many of the things I encountered there that there was no other way to make sense of it except to put it on the page. Um, I remember getting there and everybody in Charlottesville was adamant that they weren't in the South. And I was like, okay, you know, maybe I don't know anything, but you know, Robert E. Lee was still, the statue was still up in the, in the park and you know, um, a lot of students walk around and, and mention Thomas Jefferson as TJ without irony, they call him TJ. You know, people would still ask in meetings when something was gonna be built on campus, what would TJ want? What would TJ do? And I was like, where am I? <laughs> You're like, what's happening? Um, so I wrote a series of poems in the book um, called Notes on the State of Virginia, which is, um, of course, Thomas Jefferson wrote uh, a text of the same name. Um, and so this is the first of, this, of that series. Notes on the State of Virginia, one. Child of the colonies, carrying the swift waves of oceans inside of you, the wide dark of centuries, the whole world plunged down, sewn through the needle's eye, the old crows glisten in your gullet, eyes beetling through black. You wear your mother's face in the mirror, your mouth closed around all those pills like teeth, each one so heavy your tongue falls numb. Think of your friend who only wanted you to find sleep, whose face asked you not to choose the worst. Dull wretch, slack jaw orphan, you always feel sorry for yourself and swallow each capsule like the last pearl your grandfather pressed into your palm how he had dived three whole days for it. Your grandfather who loved you, but could not say it. All the men who love you and cannot say it. Jamaica, old fur sticking to the roof of my mouth, the one long dream that holds me on the water, black centipede I still teeth on, ruined train, clattering through my track. Here, I could come up for air. Here, I could wake with a name I can answer to, where Thomas Jefferson learned how to belittle a thing, how to own it. He created the word and wanted my mouth to know it. He wanted the whole world pulled through me on a fishing string where I will find my fingers in the muscle of my throat, where I will marvel at the body asking to live. Um, I'll read <clears throat> one more Virginia poem. Um, and I, this is about the street I lived on. The neighbor at the end of my street when I got there had a, um, had a Confederate flag flying. And then he also put up a Gadsden flag, which you know I didn't even know what that was until I came to America. I'm always learning the new way, names and symbols for hate. That's my American education. So the Gadsden flag is this flag with the uh, snake on it that says, don't tread on me. Um, that of course recently has been co-opted by all sorts of um, hateful groups. And so, this poem is a little bit about living on that street. Another white Christmas in Virginia. The house at the end of my street has been looming all winter, perched garishly through the sour season, pepper lights slinking red gold in its wake, heralding the sign of its own coronation, its million chittering fires, Chevy pickup colony declaring the sidewalk. This, their own white sky, old names they refuse to bury, the whole yard a boisterous spectacle. I long to set fire to all of it. The glimmering reindeer, Fat snowman inflating his visible lung, ghost child ringing his one horse bell through the night, 
that bright harassment of Santa's, the idea of America burning holes in the lawn. Who could live here with enough mirth to power my city, enough of myself haunting me in some other place? Nonetheless, one matchstick man comes and goes on their horizon, walking hard on his invisible horse, Confederate buckle stroke kicking toothpick silences. No words ever pass between us as he hoists and pulleys his large flag, daily hanging and freezing through the verbless rubble of these months, determined as an eagle clawing at its steady rituals. Don't tread on me. Still, I am resolved to come friendly, built and nested my cowboy greeting, torched it out into his world and watched it choke soundless, watched it die with my good foot caught in their blue hydrangeas, the hawk wife watching. Spies me smiling, waving in their driveway of angels, but swoops up her children and says nothing, and retreats from some darkening on the horizon, some fast approaching plague. Clap if you feel like clap, we say in Jamaica. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I um, I'll read. Let's see. Maybe I'll read a new poem. So I am. Um, I mean, I'll read a new poem. I've been working on a series of poems called Sophia the Robot, and I don't know if anyone knows of this. There's this robot called Sophia. Um, built by Hanson Robotics, um, who was the first robot to be given citizenship by Saudi Arabia. True facts. And so I was, I've been completely intrigued by so many things about that sentence. Um, you know, that a, a robot is given like citizenship in a place where, you know, women still don't have full equal rights. Um, and this robot was built by these men to resemble who they thought was the most beautiful woman in the world, um, Audrey Hepburn. And so the robot has like makeup and eyeshadow, um, but strangely like no hair. So it's like, <laughs> it's very uncanny valley. Um, and so I've been writing these poems, um, thinking about Sophia as like a dark mirror I'm stepping through of, of um, thinking about womanhood and thinking about uh, also imagining her as kind of like a bastardization of myself and my own name. And so I'm writing these persona poems about Sophia. Um, this is the first one. Sophia the robot contemplates beauty. As a girl, I held the hind legs of the small and terrified, wanted the short fur and the wet meat furrowing wanted the soft cry of the quivering boy at primary school, rock stone mashed up against his tender head, the sick milk of us poor ones sucked clean from a government issued plastic bag. At lunchtime, the children were lethal and precise, a horde hurling Ben foot at she who was helpless and I waking too surprised to hear my own cruel mouth taunting, her smile some handsome forgery of myself. Grateful even now they cannot see the bald wire patois of my shamdom, makeshift dreaming the warmth spent in the muscle of the living, the girl I grew inside my head dreaming of a real girl dreaming. I wanted a pearled purse, so I stole it. I wanted a real friend, so I let him, let her, let him, let him, let him. This 
Beauty I am eager to hoard comes slippery on ordinary days, comes not at all, comes never. Yet I am a pure shelled thing, glistening man-made against the wall where one, then two fingers entered the first time, terror dazzling the uncertainty of pleasure. It's God as real as girlhood. This is another one in the series. Sophia, the robot, sees her reflection for the first time. First, a shadow. Then, her cellophane hand ripples from the dark, neon with the lucent glamour of youth, the past a boundless specter. Between two mirrors, I study our kaleidoscope, Clear torso of wire, my silvering net of hair, lip against lip, salt from silica. Her face, a stretched word called and recalled, or once electric life flickering live as copper coils in my mouth. She grows eternal, hoisting me through air, white shock of Xerox, a ghostly doubling, her fistful of matter half in the world, half chaos, making and erasing the womb and its wound. I press my disappearing face into her fibers, tattered and thin against our meshes of breath, carbon and aluminum, flesh and rubber. I lift the hammer. Janus sister, doppelganger, demon. Growing blue into flame, self from other, pearl and steel against the glass, we shatter. Retro, artifact, mother of mothers. Okay. I'll read, uh, just two more, I'll read them. Um, the Art of Unselfing, which Noah also mentioned in um, his intro. Um, and this is a poem just simply about homesickness. And I wrote this one um, when I was living in Charlottesville and feeling completely out of place and longing for home. Let's see if I can find it. Art of Unselfing. The mind's black kettle hisses its wild exigencies at every turn, the hour before the coffee and the hour after. Pen scratch of the gone morning, woman a pitched hysteria watching the mad ant scramble, her small wants devouring, her binge and skin thrall, her old cells being shuffled off into labyrinths this birdless sky, a longing, her moth mouth rabble on facing these touch and go months under winter, torn lettuce under floorboards, each fickle moon pecked through with doubt, and one spoiled onion, pale cyclops on the kitchen counter, sprouting green missives, some act of contrition, neighbor gods vacuum a loud rule thrown down. Her mother now on the line saying, too much. You, this island is not a martyr. You tinker too much with each gaunt memory, your youth and its unweeding. Not everything blooms here a private history. Consider this immutable. Consider our galloping sun, its life, your starved homesickness, the paper wasp kingdom you set fire to, watched for days until it burnt a city in you, until a family your hands could not save became the hurricane. How love is still unrooting you. And how to grow a new body, to let each word be the wild rain swallowed pure like an antidote. Her mother at the airport saying, don't come back. Love your landlocked city, money, buy a coat, and even exile can be glamorous. 
Some nights, she calls across the deaf ocean to no one in particular. No answer. Her heart's double vault, a muted hydra. This hour, a purge of its own unselfing. She must make a home of it. I forgot why I don't read that poem often. <laughs> um, I'll finish with one, but I'll say, no, I, I was intrigued, interested in you saying I do this on, on construction. And that was something I was wrestling with recently with my English, with my editors for the memoir. They were like, no, do not say, like, you know, un, un, unfurled and unreeled and unpulled and unselfed. It's too much. I'm like, I'm a poet. I want to say it. <laughs> um, I'll end with this, this last poem. Um, I, when I was getting my PhD, I had a professor at USC, his name is Mark Irwin. He called me into his office to tell me that he thought my poems had too much of a female conceit and that I would alienate male readers and editors. And I was like, okay, um, that's on purpose. And I, I don't care. Um, but I somehow gathered the courage to go on writing my poems of little female conceit. And sometimes when I read this poem, I like to dedicate it to him, Mark Irwin <laughs> at USC. This is center of the world. The meek inherit nothing. God in his tattered coat this morning, a quiet tongue in my ear, begging for alms. Cold hands reaching up my skirt. Little lamb, paupered flock, bless my black tea with tears. I have shorn your golden fleece, worn vast spools of white lace, Glittering jacquard, gilded fig leaves, jeweled dust on my skin, corn silk hair in my hems. I have milked the stout beast of what you call America and wear your men across my chest like furs. Stick pin fox and snow blue chinchilla, they too came to nibble at my door, the soft pink tangles I trap them in. Dear watches in the shadows, dear thick-thighed fiends, at ease, please. Tell the hounds who undress me with their eyes, I have nothing to hide. I will spread myself wide. Here, a flash of muscle. Here, some blood in the hunt. Now the center of the world, my incandescent cunt. All hail the dark blooms of amaryllis and the wild pink Damascus, my sweet Aphrodite unfolding in the kink. All hail hot jasmine in the night, thick syrup in your mouth, forked dagger on my tongue, legions at my heel. Here, at the world's red Mecca kneel. Here Eden, here Bethlehem, here in the cradle of Thebes, a towering sphinx roams the garden, her wet dawn devouring. Sophia, thank you. That was really, really remarkable. Um, and if our audience wants to relive the thrills, I encourage everyone uh, to purchase a copy of Cannibal with Callie from Pegasus over there. I think um, Sophia will have some time to sign afterwards. Um, thank you again to our sponsors. If you want to sign up for our email list, 
It's on the table over there. There's a YouTube channel where you can relive this reading as others. And our next reading will be in February, on February 2nd, uh, with Nobel laureate Louise Glick, who will have to uh, have a big act to follow. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>